Hello, everybody. My name is Casey. I'm from the Pueblo Library. And today we have a special program uh, from the Plant Wildflowers grant that we received. We have a special guest, uh, Cherie from the Pueblo County Extension Office is gonna share with us how we could create helpful habitats for pollinators. So I'm gonna give it over to Cherie. Thanks for having us. All right, thanks Casey. And thank you to the Pueblo City County Library District for having me today. And a big thank you to everybody joining us from their classrooms today. I'm really excited to talk to you guys about making um, habitats for all of our native pollinators. And they're not just bees. So we'll learn about who are our pollinators around here. There's a little hint right there on the intro slide who they might be. So let's do a quick overview of pollination. I bet a lot of you already know what this is because I know you're super smart, but pollination is the process by which plants reproduce. So how it works is flowers have a part called an anther. You can see that written on the screen there. And that is the part of the flower that makes pollen. Pollen is what the flower needs to reproduce. So the way pollination works is a pollinator. So it could be a bee, a butterfly, a bird. I mean, even a bat can be a pollinator. Touches the anther while they're getting a drink of nectar and the pollen sticks to them. And then they fly to another flower to drink some more nectar. And they transfer that pollen to another part of the flower called the pistil. And this is the part that leads down to the eggs and the pollen will fertilize the eggs and a new flower will form from that. And that is how plants reproduce. So that's just a really quick overview so that while we're talking about pollinators, you understand what it is that they're doing for the flowers. So they're helping the flowers to reproduce and the flowers are helping them by giving them nectar to drink and some of them even eat the pollen as well. Pollinators are very, very important. 75%, two thirds of all flowering plants, and that includes 75% of all food crops, need the help of animal pollinators to reproduce. So about a thousand of these pollinators are things like birds, like I said, bats, which is kind of crazy, right? And even small mammals can be pollinators, but the other 200,000, so a lot more, are insects like bees, flies, beetles, moths, and butterflies. So most of them are insects. Without pollinators, most plants wouldn't be able to produce seeds or fruit. One third of all food and beverages produced wouldn't be possible without pollinators. So these are things that you probably love to eat like apples, blueberries, squash, almonds. I know nobody out there likes chocolate, right? Oh, I have a feeling you're all saying no, that you do like chocolate. And teachers, I bet you like coffee. So we need pollinators to produce those things. So that is very, very important. So we're gonna start off. We are not really talking about honeybees today. Honeybees are actually not native to the US, they are European, they're brought in to do pollination. Um, we're gonna focus today on our native bees, the ones who are from here and who have originated here. And this is a picture of one of our native bees right here on a pretty little flower. So what does native mean? Um, for us, maybe if you were born in Pueblo and you, you know, you're growing up here, you're a native of Pueblo. This is where you're from. So for the bees, the native bees are from here. They um, have originated in this area. And they also, the important thing here to keep in mind is they have co-evolved and kind of grown up, so to speak, through the generations with the native plants that we have and our native crops. So the native bees tend to be more efficient, better at pollinating our native plants and our native crops than um, honeybees that aren't native from here. A lot of our native plants actually can only be pollinated by our native bees. So they, they can't be pollinated by a honeybee or something like that. They have to have a certain type of native bee. So they're very, very important for our native plants that originate from our area. 
Native bees are often small, not always. We do have some native bumblebees, which are the big fuzzy bees that you might see buzzing around in the summer, but a lot of them you might not even notice, such as this sweat bee in the middle here, this green bee. They're very small and if you saw one, you probably would think it was a fly because it's just small, doesn't really look like a bee. They can be overlooked. So it's important to know about them and to tell your friends and your family about them so that everybody can be aware that the native bees are out there and that it's important for us to try to um, conserve them and help them to thrive. Now, I had a question come in ahead of time from Mr. Hyatt's class from North Mesa. What's the big deal with the bees disappearing? They've been hearing these rumors that bees are disappearing in Mr. Hyatt's class. That's true. We have been seeing since 1950, really, when they started doing the studies, that there have been some pretty big declines in bee populations. This includes honeybees and their man, that's what a managed hive is, people who are beekeeping. Um, those kinds of bees have been declining, but also native bees have been declining as well. And during that time, the acreage, the amount of land that has crops that needs to be pollinated has doubled. So we need them more than ever, but their populations are in decline. Um, but there is some good news. Don't feel too sad because now that people, uh, you in your classrooms and all people all over the world are starting to take notice that the bee populations have been declining and people have been starting to try to do things about it, which we'll talk about things that you can do. The numbers are on the rise. So things that we do at home to help the bees, it does matter. It really does. And the more we can spread the word about things we can do to help bees, the more those numbers are going to keep climbing back up. So I'm so glad that you asked that, Mr. Hyatt's class, and we will be talking about things we can do to help. Let's look at bee anatomy. What do their bodies look like? So bees have three body regions. They have a head, just like we do a thorax and an abdomen. The thorax is in the middle and the abdomen near the tail end. On their head, they have antenna, two antenna that are used to touch and smell. Their mouth parts are called mandibles. They're used for biting and digging. The thorax is where the wings are. Bees have two pairs of wings and three pairs of legs. Now, some bees are short-tongued and some bees are long-tongued. The bees with very long tongues can visit flowers that are very long in shape, whereas short tongue bees need uh, to visit flowers that are more shallow. So the kind of bee depends on the kind of flower that they can visit. Native bees, like I said, are very important pollinators. Um, we have one species that we'll look at a little closer here in a minute called the leaf cutter bee. They um, are cultivated to pollinate alfalfa, and they're actually, some studies are shown that they're more efficient than honeybees in pollinating alfalfa. Um, they nest in these pre-drilled boards that you see in the photo. So some farmers have these boards on their farms, they store them, um, and they'll release the young bees the next season when their alfalfa blooms. Bumblebees are excellent crop pollinators because they're really big and they're just really good at it. Even more efficient than honeybees for blueberries, cranberries, melons, and even more crops. So native bees are very important pollinators. Bumblebees do something called buzz pollination because they're so big, they, they latch onto a flower like you see here and they buzz their little wings so hard that it shakes all the pollen loose and it really increases yields. Even on plants like tomatoes and peppers that can technically pollinate themselves, they don't really technically need a bee. Bumblebees doing buzz pollination really increases the yield. So what kind of bees are in Colorado? We have a lot. Over 950 species of bees live in Colorado, but only some of those are native. They range a lot in size. Check out this drawing here. This is the smallest bee, the Perdita minima is what it's called, and along with our largest native bee, the carpenter bee. So you can see the difference in size is dramatic. Now I'm going to answer a question from Miss Emery's class at South Mesa. How do bees survive in the winter? That is such a good question. So the lifespan of a bee can vary from weeks to years. Most of our native bees 
are solitary, which we'll get into more in a minute. They don't live in a hive. They live by themselves. So they're solitary. Um, so most of these bees, they'll lay an egg in a nest of some kind. The egg will grow into a larva, which is kind of the baby form of a bee. And the larva is what survives winter. When the cold temperatures come in the winter, the adult bees die, but they've already laid their eggs. The larva are growing all through winter. And then by the time spring comes, the larva are adults and they will emerge and be the new adults for the year. So that is how most of it works. So how do they survive the winter? In their baby form is the answer to that. Let's look at a couple bees we might see around here. This is the plaster bee. It's a ground nester. So it digs holes in the ground and nests in the ground, not in a hive like a honeybee. It fills its nest cells with the liquid food, attaches its egg. That food will feed the baby all through the winter until it can emerge as an adult bee the next spring. This is a masked bee. It kind of looks like a little superhero, right? It kind of looks like a wasp too, but it's a bee. And it's a wood nester. So it makes nests in, you know, trees or just other kinds of logs or stumps that they can find around. This is a minor bee, another ground nester. Um, they're pretty big and they're shy. They, they don't really sting because they don't want to be around people. They're shy. Um, they're really only active early, early in the spring, which is why it's important to have flowers blooming all spring, summer, and fall because bees are around all of those times. This is a digger bee. This bee, the females burrow into the ground with their jaws. They dig with their jaws and create tunnels to their underground nests. And the males can actually sense where the females have nested from on top of the surface of the ground. So that's pretty neat. This is a mason bee. They are actually um, a native bee that is, is kept. People will keep these bees and um, farmers who have orchards often will keep mason bees and raise them. This is a leaf cutter bee. You can, they're, they cut these little circles out of the edge of, of um, some different plants, a lot of different plants. So sometimes people call and think somebody is eating their plant and it's a bee. They use those pieces of leaves to line their nests. Um, and they usually make their, their nests in the stems of rotting wood or the stems of plants. This is a sweat bee, that little tiny green one that we talked about. They're usually shiny, um, usually green, but they can be blue, copper, gold, or black. Farmers sometimes create beds for these bees to nest in, and they help protect those nests so that they can pollinate their alfalfa, and they those nests can remain active for decades, tens of twenties of years. This is a carpenter bee really big and black and fuzzy like a bumblebee is. Um, the females have really strong jaws so they can chomp into wood and make tunnels to nest in. Sometimes they can be cheaters because the carpenter bee females will sometimes cut a slit in the bottom of flowers and they take the nectar without going to the top and getting the pollen. So we call that nectar robbing because she's stealing the nectar without giving the flower the benefit of spreading its pollen. So that's that's kind of cheating, but that's okay. We still like her. Bumblebees. We have 23 species that are native to Colorado. These are the big fuzzy ones you see. Black and yellow stripes, your classic bee. Um, they are social. Most of our bees are solitary. They live alone, but bumblebees are what, an example of one of our social native bees. They make um, this nest like you see on the right. Their nests are usually in the ground and they look quite different than a hive that you would think of a honeybee living in. Native bee food. What do native bees eat? So they eat nectar. Like I said, that's kind of the liquid that they can suck out of a flower. That provides carbs. Like for us, bread, right, would provide carbs. For bees, it's nectar. And then sometimes they do eat the pollen and that provides protein, just like we would get from meat. They get it from the pollen. Some bees are generalists and generalists can visit a wide range of flowers. They're not picky about the kind of nectar and pollen that they can have. Some bees are specialists and specialists can only use pollen from maybe one or two different plant families. So they need to have a certain type of flower to pollinate. 
Um, okay, and Miss Pagano's class from South Mesa had asked ahead of time, how can we help the bee population grow? Here's some ideas for you. It is important that you provide food in the form of flowers and habitat. So for our wood nesters, if it was old snags or stumps, and then for our ground nesters, it would be sunny, undisturbed ground, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> where they can nest underground and dig into the ground to make their, um, their nests in their tunnels. You can plant a pollinator garden with native plants. Native plants are very important for native bees, and that is a great thing you can do to help the bee population grow. You and your family can try to avoid the use of pesticides and herbicides. These are chemicals that people use, pesticides to get rid of undesirable insects and herbicides to get rid of undesirable plants. Well, pesticides, they do, you know, get rid of the undesirable insects, but they can also hurt bees. So it's really important to limit or avoid the use as much as possible to help the bees. With herbicides, they, um, you know, they get rid of weeds, but they can also kill flowers that bees depend on. So um, limiting the use of herbicides is important too. Providing a clean water source like a bird bath and providing areas of mud is important for native bees. And if you are going to grow a pollinator garden, you should try to have plants that are blooming all season. You want to have at least three things blooming early in the spring, three things blooming in the summer, and three things blooming in the fall. That is ideal for a pollinator garden. And another fun thing that you could do at home is to build a, a bee house or a native bee hotel, which is this top picture here. So there's lots of ideas online about how to do this. And basically, it's just a little area where the bees can go and nest in and have a safe place to um, have future generations grow. So making a bee house is a really fun thing that you can do at home. <coughs> and this is a mason bee house. You can do this too, just with a large tube and then some small st hollow sticks. And this is where a mason bee would like to build its nests. So that's another thing that you can do at home and hang it, you know, high up on your on the side of your house. And that will help with the mason bee population. Let's do a couple fun facts about native bees. Our vegetable gardens need bees to be able to produce a bountiful harvest, which we love growing homegrown vegetables. So that's important. Here's kind of a strange one. Most of our bees around here forage and go do their pollination during the day when the flowers are open. But in the tropics, they have some species of bees that are strictly nocturnal and they feed on nectar from nocturnal flowers and they navigate using moonlight. And this is a picture of one of those nocturnal bees that only are out at night. Kind of crazy looking. All right. Oops. Let's get into hummingbirds. Oh my gosh, how fun are hummingbirds? You get to see one in your yard. It's so fun. Um, there are many plants that depend solely on hummingbirds for their pollination. So no other um, bees or anything like that can pollinate certain plants. They need hummingbirds. They eat insects. So that's important because they could eat things like mosquitoes, insects that we don't really want around. And it is so thrilling to see a hummingbird in your yard. If any of you have seen a hummingbird in your yard, it's very, very exciting. I think you'll know that. Let's talk about the conservation status of hummingbirds. So 10% of all hummingbirds in the world are threatened with extinction. So it's important to talk about them and promote their awareness. Um, the species that we have in North America here on our continent are actually the most well off. So that's good. Um, most of the endangered species of hummingbirds are experiencing um, loss of their habitats because they're being converted to agricultural land in Central and South America. So that's kind of the biggest threat to hummingbirds overall on a worldwide level. This is hummingbird anatomy. This is kind of what a hummingbird looks like. They have these long slender bills and long tongues that are used to drink nectar. They have hollow bones. They're super, super light, and that's why they can fly so fast. Their brain is 4.2% of their body weight, 
which is the largest brain um, percentage wise in the animal kingdom. They have a huge brain compared to their body size and they are temperamental. They're kind of grumpy. They fight. They're territorial. So they're so pretty and so cute, but they are kind of grumpy, which is funny. <coughs> Many flowers, <coughs> excuse me, have evolved special characteristics that bring the hummingbirds in and say, hey, come over here and visit me. So things that the flowers have developed are that they're brightly colored, like orange and red usually. They have long tubular shapes. They're open during the day when the birds are out. And they have a lot, a lot of nectar production because it takes a lot of energy to fly as fast as a hummingbird does. So they need lots of nectar for energy. And since they eat a lot and they're frequent feeders, they're ideal at pollinating flowers. They're really, really good at it. <coughs> um, this is kind of interesting. Hummingbirds are only found in the Western Hemisphere. So that half of the earth that we live on, that's the only place that hummingbirds are found. Most of them live in Central and South America, but there are species that live in North America. And we actually only have four species that we will act, be able to see in Colorado. So let's look at those. This is the broad-tailed hummingbird. It breeds in the mountains, but it does make stops at lower elevation sometimes, like here in Pueblo. It's more common on the western side of the state, whereas we're on the eastern side. It eats nectar from flowers, it eats insects, and they do visit hummingbird feeders. You can see this picture, this one is on a hummingbird feeder. This is the Rufus hummingbird. It has the longest documented migration of any bird in the world. It travels 3,900 miles one way from Mexico to Alaska. That's where it migrates to. That's a long way. Um, so they are migrants. They do migrate, but they are common at um, our lower elevations in the spring. And then you'll see them in the mountain meadows in the summer, in the fall. And they also will visit a hummingbird feeder if they see one. <coughs> this is the black chin hummingbird. Common in the western half of the state. Again, it's often we find it around water. So rivers, lakes, streams, things like that. In kind of more city areas, they prefer to be in tall trees and flowering shrubs and vines. We usually start seeing hummingbirds around here in April, and they start leaving back toward Mexico in September. This one also feeds on nectar insects and will visit a hummingbird feeder. And the last one you might see in Colorado is the Calliope hummingbird. It can be found in mountains and at lower elevation, so it's kind of all over. It's the smallest bird in North America. It's teeny tiny. It usually will visit low growing flowers, so flowers that are kind of low covering the ground. It does eat insects, does visit feeders, and is this one's pretty common to see around here in Colorado in general. This is a cool map that you can pull up in your classroom at hummingbirdcentral.com and you would kind of zoom in on the area that you're interested in. So I kind of zoomed in on Colorado here and you can see these are people reported sightings of certain species of hummingbirds. So if you look real close here at Pueblo, it looks like people are mostly reporting seeing the black chinned hummingbird around our area. So that is the one that you'll be on the lookout for. So hummingbird habitats, having a bunch of flowers is most important, having a safe shelter for them to rest, so, you know, a, a tree or some shrubs, pesticides like we talked about can harm the birds, and then they all, it also kills the insects that they eat. So avoiding pesticides is important for hummingbirds as well, and talking about them to your friends and family so that other people can create hummingbird habitats as well, that's important too. Um... Plants that are non-native tend to crowd out natives and kind of disrupt the ecosystem. This can be a threat to a hummingbird. Here's another threat, stray cats. Stray cats often will get a hold of hummingbirds. And that is a pretty big, especially in like city areas, that's a pretty big threat to hummingbirds. 
Here's another thing that you have to keep in mind is dirty hummingbird feeders or hot hummingbird feeders can also kill a hummingbird. So you want to put the feeders in the shade because if they get really, really hot and those little hummingbirds drink the nectar from inside the feeder, it can burn them badly. So it's important to keep them cool and to keep them clean. And then if they become trapped in a garage or something like that, they become worn out very easily because they're very small. And um, so it's important try to tr not try to let them become trapped. And this is a funny picture here. This hummingbird is very mad because this praying mantis is on its feeder and it doesn't like that. I told you, they're kind of grumpy. <coughs> so hummingbird food. Nectar gives them the energy they need to fly all around like they do. They can drink up to two times their body weight per day. And they drink, sometimes they drink tree sap from holes in trees made by woodpeckers. That's kind of interesting. Um, their protein comes from insects that they catch on the fly. This hummingbird in this photo has caught itself an insect and it is probably happy. Um, they get enough water from nectar, but they are attracted to fountains and bird baths and things like that. Just, you know, birds like to take a little bath every once in a while. Also, insects are attracted to those, those bird baths and things. So the hummingbirds will go there trying to look for some insects to eat. Hummingbird feeders, like I said, placed in a shady area, a few feet off the ground, away from cats is the best thing to do. The colored red nectar is not necessary. In fact, that red dye can be harmful to the hummingbirds. So all you really need to do is dissolve some sugar in some water. That's all they need. Um, avoid honey and anything artificial. And then you have to clean them frequently so they don't get any kind of bacteria or fungal growth in them. And this is a cool idea of a feeder that you can make at home. So you can just get any kind of glass bottle. These stoppers, they sell on Amazon or on online in a lot of places. And it's just a stopper that goes in the end of the bottle. And this part right here is just the hummingbird feeder part. And then the wire is just a, you know, a thick gauge copper wire that you'd wrap around the bottle and use that to hang it. And that's a cool little project that you can do at home to make a, a nice looking hummingbird feeder. Cool. A couple little hummingbird facts. Um, when they're migrating, they fly nonstop for 18 to 22 hours. I couldn't even imagine walking that long. So that's pretty impressive. The bee hummingbird is the smallest living bird in the world. It only weighs two grams. And hummingbirds are the only bird in the world that can fly backwards. So that's kind of a little fun fact. All right, and that brings us to our last pollinator, butterflies. Another thing that it's so exciting to see around your yard. So there's between 12,000 and 15,000 species of butterflies that exist worldwide. In North America, we have about 750 species. Um, butterflies are important because they indicate a thriving ecosystem. If scientists see that there's a lot of butterflies in an area, that indicates that everything is going really good in that ecosystem and the balance is good. There's not really anything harmful going on. So they're used by scientists a lot to kind of check the health of an ecosystem. They're really important to the food chain as predators, mostly in their caterpillar form, and we'll go over that, and as prey because there are things that eat butterflies. Um, they're very sensitive to a changing climate. So scientists also use them as indicators for climate change to kind of see um, how that's going and um, where we might be able to change it. Butterfly conservation status. There are 27 species of butterflies in the United States that are considered critically imperiled. That means they're not extinct, but their populations are decreasing. So we're keeping an eye on them. One species that you probably have heard about because it's been getting a lot of attention in recent years is the monarch. In 2014, they tried to get it on the endangered species list, but in 2020, they decided that they worry it wasn't quite um, endangered yet. So it's it's looking okay for the monarchs, but it's important to keep talking about them and letting people know about them so we can conserve them. Butterfly anatomy. Here's some of their parts. They have a forewing up top and a hindwing down here, a head, and just like the bees, they have a thorax and an abdomen. Um, they have antennas as well. 
So just kind of a little um, picture of the parts of a butterfly. And then what is a butterfly before it's a butterfly? Anybody read the book, The Very Hungry Caterpillar? Yes, they are caterpillars before they are butterflies. So they're kind of the same animal, right? <laughs> um, this is the caterpillar anatomy. Not as pretty, maybe. We'll look at some pictures of some pretty ones, but they are caterpillars first before they become beautiful butterflies. Let's look at the life cycle of a butterfly. So they go through something called complete metamorphosis, which means they completely change the way they look in their life cycle. So it all starts out with eggs up here in the top. Eggs are laid on the surface of a leaf that the caterpillar will want to eat. The, the butterfly lays those eggs so that when they hatch, the caterpillar can eat right away. The caterpillar is also known as a larva. It All the caterpillar does is eat. If you've read the book, The Very Hungry Caterpillar, you know that all he is doing is eating in preparation to go into his pupa or chrysalis, or you may have heard it called a cocoon. The caterpillar will build this cocoon and be inside where it will become a butterfly, which is the adult stage of the life cycle. And their main goal is to mate and lay eggs and start the cycle over again. So butterflies are pollinators. Um, the checklist for flowers that butterflies like to visit, red, yellow, or orange, open during the day, deep, plentiful nectar. Sometimes they have, these flowers have nectar guides or some kind of coloration that points the butterfly down to where the nectar is. And they often visit flowers that are in clusters. So they have a nice little landing pad to land on while they do their pollinating. They're active during the day. They're not quite as efficient as bees at pollinating, but they still do a pretty good job. Um, they have good vision, but a weak sense of smell. And we didn't really talk about this, but bees can't see red, but butterflies can. So they like red flowers. Here's some butterflies you might see in Colorado. So I have the butterfly and the caterpillar for all of these species of butterflies that you might see in Colorado. And we'll talk about the plants that you'll see them on too. So this is the black swallowtail butterfly and caterpillar. They start flying in April and they fly all the way to September, the butterfly anyway. <coughs> the caterpillars will be found on dill, parsley, fennel, and carrot, and the adults will pollinate butterfly weed, alfalfa, and thistle. This is called the two-tailed swallowtail. Oh my gosh, look at that caterpillar and its big old head. They fly April to August. The caterpillars eat green ash trees and chokecherry trees, so this is one we'll mostly see on trees, and the adults will pollinate geranium, thistle, and milkweed. The monarch, um, another one we'll see, There's it's, it's caterpillars kind of pretty. They start flying in June and they'll fly all the way to October. The caterpillars only eat milkweed. So that's why milkweed is actually an important plant to grow if you want to um, help out the monarchs. Milkweed, the sap inside of milkweed is toxic. So it makes the caterpillar and the butterfly kind of distasteful and like almost borderline poisonous to predators. So they don't really get eaten by, and other other animals know like, oh, I'm not gonna eat that monarch or that caterpillar because they're, they're toxic. So other species will mimic, they look like monarchs just because predators know that the monarchs are poisonous. So they'll mimic and say, oh, I look like a monarch, please don't eat me either. Um, adults will, will pollinate cosmos, Canada thistle, and a bush called a rabbit brush that we have a lot of here in Pueblo. This is the morning cloak, and its caterpillar is kind of pokey and scary looking. It, they start flying in February, so pretty early, and they fly all the way to November. They're around a really long time. The caterpillars eat willow, aspen, cottonwood, and elm. Those are all trees, so this caterpillar will be found on trees. And the adults will pollinate rabbit brush, milkweed, and they also will eat sap from trees. This is called clouded sulfur. It's a cute, small, little yellow butterfly. They start flying in April and will fly till November. The caterpillars eat alfalfa and clover. And the adults will pollinate alfalfa, phlox, rabbit brush again, aster, and marigolds, which a lot of us have in our gardens. 
This is called variegated fritillary. What a name, huh? And look at its pokey little caterpillar. They start flying in April all the way till October. The caterpillars eat a lot of plants. They're not super picky, but um, pansies are one of their favorites. And the adults pollinate rabbit brush and Canada thistle. You'll see a lot of them do the thistle and the rabbit brush. So thistle is considered a weed, but rabbit brush is a great plant to plant in your landscape for butterflies. Threats to butterflies, um, human development, you know, we take away when we build a lot of things, we tend to take away their, um, their shelter and their flowers that they use to eat. And another threat is sometimes low flying butterflies can't fly over really high walls. So that's another threat, they could become trapped. Butterfly food. It's important to provide food for the caterpillars and the adults to help out the butterflies. Um, adult butterflies eat nectar from flowers for energy, but they also might feed on what's called honeydew from an insect called an aphid that is sometimes on plants. Um, they will eat sap. They will eat rotting fruit. And ew, yuck, they also sometimes will eat bird droppings. But hey, to each their own. Um, Mr. Hyatt's class is asking, what's the most common type of butterfly? Um, you know, around here, I do see the black swallowtails a lot. I see one called, I don't know if I had a picture of it, a painted lady a lot. It kind of looks like a monarch. Um, those are the big ones that I see in my yard a lot. But any of those that I just mentioned can be found in Pueblo. So habitats for butterflies. Um, plants are the most important. All those plants we just talked about that attract the butterflies are the caterpillars. That's the most important. Of course, again, reducing or eliminating the use of pesticides. Having a water source. So if you have a bird bath and you can put some rocks in it so the butterflies have somewhere to land, that is a good thing to do for the butterflies. Um, Butterfly houses are not good, though. There's been a lot of research lately that shows that they actually can be dangerous because if you look at this bottom picture, that's a wasp nest and wasps will kill butterflies. So a lot of times these nests get, um, get you know, taken over by wasps and then the butterflies go in and they're trapped in there with the wasps. So we're actually not suggesting butterfly houses right now anymore. We, it's much more important just to have the plants that they like to live in. Um, we have a question. Are there any genetically modified bees? Oh, not that I know of. Um, and are bees deadly to humans? Some humans are allergic to bees, but um, in general, bees are not out to sting. They will only sting if they're provoked. So in general, no, not deadly to humans. Um, and are certain caterpillars poisonous? We have a okay, mm, None that I know of off the top of my head. No, none that I can think of. Caterpillars are usually pretty, pretty safe. Um, so how to attract butterflies again? Adult males are attracted to mud and around puddles of water. We're not quite sure why. We think they might be getting minerals from the mud that they need. Um, females, they're just searching for those plants to lay their eggs on. So all those plants we just mentioned that the caterpillars like, that's what the females are looking for. Um, and planting flowers that will be blooming for long periods of time, particularly during the summer, which is when we'll see the most butterflies. Common conflicts. So there are some conflicts, particularly with caterpillars. Some plants that are attractive to butterflies are considered to be weeds. So the thistle, for example. It's considered a noxious weed, but the, the butterflies really like it. So that's kind of a conflict that we have to wrestle with. And then with the caterpillars, they can really do a number on your garden. They will eat a parsley plant down to nothing in a couple of hours because they eat and eat and eat and eat. That's their goal, right? So the um, broccoli, uh, parsley, some other herbs, dill, mustard plants, if you're growing those, it can be kind of tough because the caterpillars can just eat the heck out of them. And then you're like, oh, I want to help you, but you're eating all my parsley. So what I say, it's always good to grow some parsley for you and grow some parsley for them. And then if you see a caterpillar on your parsley, you move it over to their patch. And so that's a good thing you can do. What is the largest butterfly and what is the wingspan of a monarch? Ooh, 
I'm not sure off the top of my head. I know that two-tailed swallowtail is pretty big. Um, I don't know off the top of my head the wingspan of a monarch. I'll have to do a little further research on that. Um, but that's all I had for my presentation. If anybody else has questions, I could answer them to the best of my abilities. Well, wow, Cherie, that was such a good presentation. I learned so much. Um, thank you for doing that for us today. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Um, we do have, let's see. Well, I think we have time for another question and we got one here in the comments. Let's, oh, there's that. Let's see. Oh, this, here's the question. Well, the, okay, that one at the bottom there, why do bees die if they sting? So some species of bees actually do lose their stinger. When they sting, it stays in the, the person or the animal that they stung. And you can imagine that losing a big chunk of your body creates a wound that um, that sometimes they just can't heal from. So yeah, it is. And that's why they don't want to sting you because they could be deadly to them. So, you know, they're only stinging if they feel threatened and they might die from it. So they don't want to sting. <laughs> Well, um, thanks again, Cherie, for all this great information. And we want to thank the Pueblo County Extension Office. Um, is there a website or phone number you'd like to give out to people if they had more questions or? Yeah, of course. You can visit our website at pueblo.extension.colostate.edu, or you can just Google Pueblo County Extension. That's even easier sometimes. Um, and if you wanted to give me a call, to ask any questions, you can call 719-583-6566. That can also be found when you Google Pueblo County Extension. And yeah, happy to answer any questions from anybody. So That's great. And we might have time for one more. I did also yeah. want to plug the Pueblo Library real quick. Um, over here at the Jai Dome branch out in the county on Saturday, April 23rd, Starting at 1030, we're going to have some fun programs for the family, starting with the bee story time. Uh, we're also going to make a bee mobile um, that you can hang up. Um, we're going to have a wildflower planting party with uh, Holly David from the Pueblo Zoo is coming. And we have a pocket prairie outside here at the Jidome Branch. And we're going to add some um, wildflower seeds to that to help um feed these pollinators that we're all wanting to help. And uh, I think we do have time for one more question we got here, uh, which is um, how much food can a butterfly eat in a day? Oh my gosh, a lot. <laughs> and so when I say a lot, it's like a lot to a butterfly. I mean, they don't weigh a lot. So eating, you know, I bet they can eat up to like three times their body weight, which isn't a lot maybe to us because that's still like a small amount, but to a butterfly, that's a ton. You Can you imagine eating three times your body weight in a day? Oh my gosh, we would be sleepy, I think. <laughs> <laughs> only chocolate. Yes. Only uh, chocolate. But well, thanks again, Cherie. And thanks everybody for joining us and asking questions. Um, all the students from D60 and D70. Uh, thanks for joining us and uh, we'll see you next time.